So hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Larkin, and I am an architect in NVIDIA's HPC software team. And so I wanted to give you an overview today uh, of really the topics that are going to be covered in greater detail through uh, the rest of today and in tomorrow. So give you just the high-level introduction to our platform, to our uh, vision for how you should program that platform, and the software that we provide to, to enable you. <clears throat> and to start, I want you to, and I'm going to turn my video off so I don't eat up my bandwidth. So there we go. Uh, to start, I want to discuss what uh, the what is the NVIDIA platform. So uh, frequently people will think of us as the GPU company because we've certainly um, been innovators uh, in the GPU space uh, from, from the beginning. And that is um, has certainly been our bread and butter over, over the lifetime of our company. But in the last several years, we have expanded that to a, a broader platform. Uh, first, through the uh, acquisition of Mellanox, providing us with an InfiniBand network uh, portion of the company. Um, that's happened a little over a year and a half ago. And then last year, uh, Jensen, our CEO, announced the, the Grace CPU that is coming uh, in the future. And so uh, at, at an uh, unannounced time in the future, we will have uh, a CPU, uh, ARM-based CPU as well. So uh, we need to provide you with um, a, a coherent vision for how to program for all of this, not just the GPU, but also the CPU and also the network. And uh, this is what, what we tell people. And first, I want to point out this foundation down the bottom of our accelerated libraries. And I think of these libraries as the foundation on which we build the rest of this. And so we have uh, a broad range of libraries available to you beginning with the core libraries that expose basic data structures and algorithms, uh, math libraries. We've got a huge set of libraries for linear algebra, random, uh, random numbers, FFTs, uh, and things like that. We also provide you with communication libraries, uh, MPI, of course, but also um, our collective communication library, Nickel, and our uh, Schmem implementation, NVSchmem. And then we also provide support for various data analytics and AI packages. And then um, uh, most recently, we've added support for, uh, for acceleration of uh, quantum simulation. So this is the basis on which we build the rest of that strategy. And for many people, the assumption is that we at NVIDIA believe that all developers should be writing uh, this code on the right, which is uh, CUDA C++. And we also have support for uh, CUDA Fortran as well. Uh, CUDA is, uh, came out at a time when programming for GPUs was very difficult and we needed to provide a, uh, a, the proper abstractions to be able to do general purpose compute on the GPUs. And CUDA remains the place where we innovate. So if we introduce new features on our hardware, you can expect them to come to CUDA C++ and CUDA Fortran first. And this is where we'll expose those features and in various innovations in software. Uh, however, it is not the only approach to programming our platform. And in fact, uh, our goal is that for most developers, you'll come to our platform with these approaches on the far left, which we call accelerated standard languages. And you'll hear, hear some other terms. Uh, sometimes you'll hear us refer to STUDPAR, shortened for standard parallelism, or I like the term standard language parallelism because it encapsulates the fact that these are standard programming languages, ISO C++ here, uh, ISO Fortran here, and then also Python, which uh, doesn't have an ISO standard behind it, but it has become a, a de facto standard in its own. In each of these cases, we are using what is native to that programming language to implement a parallel algorithm, in this case, uh, Saxby. So here I have a standard transform. I'm saying to write it, uh, to execute it in parallel, and then I'm uh, providing the implementation for that. Same thing with Fortran. With Fortran, do concurrent has been in the language now since 2008. And uh, we have supported it on our uh, across CPUs and GPUs since uh, 2020. And it is actually supported in other compilers as well to express that uh, the iterations of this loop can be run in any order. And so we can actually parallelize this for multi-core CPUs and for GPUs. And the more recent addition is Kunumeric which provides a similar interface uh, for Python. And I'll go into more detail on that in a few slides. 
by focusing your efforts on these standard languages, it means that you can come to our platform or any other platform with a code that is already parallel. And will it be the, uh, the highest performing code that you can achieve on our GPUs? Probably not. Uh, most likely, if you want to get absolute the best possible performance exploiting everything in the hardware, you'll still want to write it in CUDA C++ or Fortran. But your baseline, which you run, will uh, already run out of the box on, on day one using these standard languages. Now, there is a functionality gap between, uh, between these approaches. And we use directives to span that gap. So as a, as a for instance, uh, in these, uh, these approaches on the left, there's no way to represent uh, your data transfer. And so we've built them on top of uh, CUDA unified memory. But if you wanted to take control and further optimize the code, uh, you can incrementally optimize your code using something like OpenACC or OpenMP. But we still believe the best place to start is with the standard languages. So what do we provide you to, uh, to program to this vision? Uh, and the product we have is the HPC SDK. Uh, you will sometimes see the acronym NVHPC as well. The HPC SDK is a single package that provides all of the tools and libraries and programming languages and compilers that you need in order to be a successful HPC programmer. So all of the programming models I discussed, standard C++ and Fortran, OpenACC, OpenMP, uh, CUDA C++, CUDA Fortran are all available to you uh, through the HPC SDK. We provide compilers for C, C++, Fortran, and then we also support the traditional CUDA compiler, NVCC. And then we package up a ton of libraries to make you successful. Here I've listed CUDA C++, which is uh, a subset of the C++ standard library for GPUs. Thrust, which is a higher level um, uh, template library for, uh, for writing code that's portable across CPUs and GPUs, and CUB, which is a, our um, um, a collectives library, a communications library here. Uh, we also have, um, for it's uh, building blocks for other, for other algorithms. We also have support for our math libraries. So some that you may be familiar with be KubeLaws, KubeSolver, and KubeFFT. And uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the most important ones. And lastly, we do provide support for communication libraries for MPI, NV, Shmem, and Nickel. And then because um, you need to be able to debug and, and understand the performance of this, we also provide you with debuggers and profilers. So all of this is available inside the HPC SDK package. And when you load the, um, the modules that, uh, that both Helen and Suzanne listed, this is what you get. Now I'll point out that this is not limited to machines like Perlmutter and Summit, that this is freely available for you to download for any machine. Uh, you don't even need to have a GPU in that machine. It's available uh, for free from our website. Uh, it's available by containers using the NVIDIA uh, NGC, also SPAC, and even on the various cloud providers, we provide uh, AMIs for that. And we typically release uh, somewhere around seven or eight times per year. Our last release was actually just last week with the 22.1. Now, some people are surprised to learn that our HPC compilers are not just GPU compilers. In fact, uh, we want them to be uh, best in class CPU compilers as well. And so we do provide a uh, high degree of CPU optimization across all of the supported uh, architectures, which is uh, x86 power and ARM server class CPUs. Uh, including parallelization and, and vectorization. But of course, we want your code to run great on our GPUs. And as, as new GPUs come out, we add support uh, quickly to make sure that we provide uh, the best acceleration on our GPUs, many of which can be done automatically uh, using approaches like standard language parallelism. I mentioned we provide support for um, all of the major programming languages, directives plus CUDA C++, and it's available on, um, on three uh, platforms x86, ARM, and, and open power. So why are we advocating for this approach of standard language parallelism? And uh, we recognize that for many of you, you were not uh, necessarily consider yourself computer scientists. You were not consider yourself software engineers. For most of you are in fact scientists first, and you've learned to program in order to enable that science through simulation. And so many of you will, will have applications you've developed on other platforms uh, and it's running along uh, in, in that 
uh, in that lane and you're making good progress, but you recognize the, uh, the performance benefit of being able to run on GPUs. And so standard language parallelism provides you with an on-ramp to get to the GPUs so that you can run code that is uh, natively able to run on the, on, uh, continue to run on CPUs, but also on our GPUs. And then once you're on the GPUs, you can begin to look at other optimizations, such as directives, uh, CUDA C++, and Fortran, uh, in order to better optimize your code and bring it farther and farther into the fast lane. So standard language parallelism provides you with a means to get onto pa all parallel platforms uh, very quickly. And this is not a decision that we made overnight to, uh, to uh, strive towards standard language parallelism, but it's actually an investment we've made over the past decade. So we've been participating in the various ISO committees uh, for, for more than the past decade and actually have, uh, we participate not just with, uh, our, with the national labs, but with also with our, uh, we collaborate with our competitors in these spaces of the ISO committees. So as we began to support standard language parallelism in our software stack in 2020, uh, but that, uh, that fruit was actually tended and, and, and planted more than a decade earlier and it has only been through continued engagement with the standards committees that we have uh, we've developed this. And we believe that by focusing on bringing concurrency and parallelism to all of these languages that makes standard language parallelism the tide that raises all of the boats. So this is available to you everywhere. And you honestly can't beat the portability of these ISO languages because they have the strongest track record of, of being supported in compilers on every platform. Uh, we've contributed a variety of major features, and I don't need to necessarily call all of these out, but I will, uh, I will mention a few of them that parallel algorithms, which began support in C++17 and was enhanced in C++20, is one area that uh, you'll actually be uh, exposed to a little bit uh, over, over the next two days. I'll also point out these uh, multidimensional array abstractions solely because uh, it is a collaboration that took place between NVIDIA and, and the national labs, as well as the rest of the ISO uh, committee. And we continue to drive forward with, with new features. So what does HPC programming look like in C++? Well, the first thing I'll point out is that we use the NVC++ compiler to, uh, to accomplish these, uh, the acceleration of these parallel algorithms. Uh, and so that's the, the compiler that you will use, whether it's directly or through, uh, through Craze wrappers. And it does provide support for um, uh, uh, coarse grain parallelism, but also vector concurrency. Uh, some of this uh, comes about uh, through enhancements in the programming model and the compilers, but also with our hardware. And so our most recent hardware enables us, um, those several last two generations have enabled us to make forward progress guarantees that enable support for the C++ execution model on our accelerators and also uh, the C++ memory model. Uh, C++20 enhanced uh, the synchronization libraries, and you can see that we actually have provided support for many of these, uh, these primitives in the lib C++ library. And we are continuing to drive forward with uh, new features such as the uh, sender's receivers proposal, MD span and MD array, uh, range-based parallel algorithms, and, and so on. So this is an ongoing, uh, ongoing process. To highlight some of the successes we've had, uh, first, we'll start with a mini app called uh, Lulesh. Uh, this comes from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. It's a hydrodynamics mini app, and it's written in C++ with uh, somewhere around 9,000 lines of code. Now, you know, mini apps are designed to be able to test out a variety of approaches, and they uh, have approaches for MPI, OpenMP, and, and, other, uh, and, and other technologies. So if I show you just a snippet of the code, and this is one uh, representative uh, function here. You can see that using their baseline OpenMP, you can see the use of ifdefs here to support serial or parallel execution. You can see the introduction of a, you know, a, a parallel pragma here to spawn the CPU threads and to the OMP4 here to work share this loop. And this is a fairly typical OpenMP code with the, uh, the addition of these pragmas and ifdefs. Uh, this is the code that they run in, in production, as a matter of fact. Now, we worked with them to restructure the code uh, to use solely standard C++. 
And so this function on the left gets transformed into this function on the right. Um, and you may have to stare at it a little bit to believe me, but these are actually are accomplishing the exact same thing. And you can see the code is a lot more compact and, and uh, easier to read and maintain. Uh, here we're using a, a standard transform uh, algorithm. We're uh, telling the compiler that it can execute this code in parallel. And then inside of this, you can see we have uh, first the transformation, which is this top loop, and then the reduction here, which is this bottom loop. So you can see this makes the code uh, a lot more, a lot easier to read. But because it is fully ISO standard, it's portable to any compiler that supports uh, ISO C++. And here is a list of, of several that we've tried it in. And in addition to all of those benefits from this code, I'll also point out that it's faster too. So here uh, is the baseline code that I showed. And again, that was just one function out of the entire code. Uh, and you can see building with GCC on a 64 core AMD Epic server, uh, that is our baseline performance. Changing from GCC to NVC++, you see the, the, the runtime is fairly consistent uh, between those two uh, compilers on this platform. Now, switching from OpenMP to solely ISO standard C++, you can see GCC gave us about a 50% performance enhancement. Uh, OpenMP has, uh, has various uh, inefficiencies and overheads uh, in the programming model that, uh, that we were able to eliminate uh, using, uh, using standard C++. If you switch to uh, NVC++, you can see that improves to a 2x performance improvement. Again, same, uh, same CPU and same version of the compiler. But what's really powerful with this is you can change one compiler flag and now take that same standard ISO C++ code and you're running on an NVIDIA GPU as well. So all of this can be accomplished without any additional APIs. Uh, or language extensions. Another code I'll highlight is called uh, Maya. This comes from, uh, I believe it's RWTH uh, Aachen University. Um, we worked with them on a portion of their code that uses the lattice Boltzmann method. This is the fluid flow portion. Um, and we accelerate it using just standard C++. So the code uh, on the left, again, becomes something like the code on the right. So you can see, once again, the code is more compact and it's completely standard compliant. Uh, in terms of performance, we actually saw a, a pretty sizable performance improvement there as well. Uh, and this is uh, this one I would call not typical in that we uh, actually achieved a fairly large uh, performance improvement in, uh, in the standard C++ code because of various things that were uh, eliminated from the, uh, uh, during the rewrite from OpenMP to uh, standard C++. So this is a fairly large an atypical performance improvement. But what is typical here is that we can then take again that same code and run it on, uh, on the GPU as well. So you can't take this baseline code and run it straight to the GPU, but um, by rewriting and making your baseline code parallel first, uh, you can take that code and run it um, on CPUs or GPUs uh, very effectively. The last C++ code that I'll highlight is STLBM. This is another Lattice Boltzmann code, this time from the University of Geneva. And one of the things that I love about this code is that um, this team went off and did it completely on their own. They had a goal of being able to run on a variety of platforms uh, using no external uh, APIs. And so they wrote their code using standard C++, uh, the par parallel algorithms available in C++ 17. And, uh, and these were the results. So they're able to run across their entire 40-core uh, um, Xeon server, but rebuilding that code, uh, changing the compiler options to target the GPUs, they could run on the GPUs as well. And I would point you to um, uh, two, uh, two talks they did. This first one is uh, GTC Spring, so last March, and this last one is GTC Fall. And I'm sorry, I, I should have updated this with the link to that, uh, because he goes into a great amount of detail about um, about what was involved in this transformation and actually shows results on more than just the A100, but on several, uh, several of their servers and GPUs. So I encourage you to go look up these talks because it's really, uh, he goes into some great detail, but to, to quote him, he, they viewed this as a paradigm shift for them for cross-platform CPU and GPU programming, that they could do this with uh, solely ISO C++. Now, Fortran is still a very important language in uh, high performance computing and within uh, within your labs, I know there are a lot of uh, Fortran codes as well. 
so beginning with uh, with the uh, the 2020 versions of our compilers, we began accelerating uh, various parts of the Fortran language automatically as well. So to begin with, we were able to uh, begin to accelerate the um, array math intrinsics inside the library. So looking at things like a matmol and recognizing that uh, this matmol can be mapped to our accelerated math libraries uh, automatically, again, using the um, CUDA unified memory. We expanded that support six months later uh, in the, the November uh, release to support the do concurrent. So now you can write your loops using this Fortran 2008 feature, do concurrent, and it can um, thread paralyze it on your CPU or it can automatically offload it uh, to your GPU as well. Uh, we do intend to eventually support uh, co arrays. I don't have a comment on when that will be coming, but it's something that we are uh, actively looking at as well. Um, and then a new feature that um, actually has been approved for Fortran, but is uh, the, the version of Fortran that it will be in has not yet been released, is uh, reductions on do concurrent loops. So if you're not familiar with the reduction, if you do something like a, a summation or finding the min or the max within a loop, um, you have you know, many values that you need to reduce down to just one, whether it's the sum or the min or the max or whatever. Um, the, um, the Fortran specification did not have a way to do this. You actually had to write a do concurrent loop and then use a, um, a, one of these math intrinsics to accomplish the reduction. Um, but uh, this next version of Fortran has support for a reduce clause and we actually already have preview support for it in the compiler. So you could write a do concurrent with a reduction um, since uh, NV Fortran uh, 2111. I uh, recognize that for this, um, this event, you're using 21.9, which doesn't have it yet, but um, the very next version that, that uh, becomes available to you will have that support. So this is what it looks like. Uh, here you can see a, a fairly simple uh, routine from a, a, a Laplace operator here. Uh, here we are um, uh, doing a stencil operation that would normally be written as a uh, I loop and a J loop. You can see here we write a single do concurrent loop and say, uh, you know, iterate across all of I and all of J. And the reason you combine all this together is it gives the compiler a huge amount of information that not just can the I uh, iterations be run in any order and not just the J iterations, but across the entire iteration space, you, they can be run in any order. And that gives us a ton of opportunity to accelerate. And you can see here, once again, you can run this on, on your CPUs, you can run it on your GPUs. And actually the performance here is, is comparable to, uh, to open ACC version of the code. Uh, I mentioned the math intrinsics, I'll just demonstrate here. Um, I hope none of you have, uh, have a naive matrix multiplication like this in your code, but if you do, uh, one thing you can do is replace it with, uh, with a matmol operation like this. And you can see, not surprisingly, that you get a pretty substantial performance benefit because we're able to um, <clears throat> map this to our accelerated math libraries. And that's not limited to just simple things like matrix multiplication, but actually you can see uh, that we support a, a pretty broad range of, uh, of these uh, intrinsics. So our goal with accelerating the standard languages um, is that you could take this, uh, take the same code, whether it's in C++ or in Fortran or even in Python, as I'll discuss in just a moment, and be able to run it across your CPUs or your GPUs. And so you can see here for the compiled languages, I, I simply had to change one compiler flag in order to, um, uh, to retarget the code. And then using um, the Python code, you can see here that I can once again scale it as well um, across CPUs or GPUs. <clears throat> so let me talk about Python next. <clears throat> Python has increasingly become an important language in high performance computing. Um, and this is something, I'm sorry, somebody needs to, to go on mute. I'm hearing some typing noise. The, um, the packages uh, in the, um, the PyData ecosystem that are used most often is this, uh, is this NumPy package. This is um, the, the common approach to writing uh, numerical algorithms in, uh, in Python. And it dates back to uh, right around the year 2000. And you can see this code down here um, that performs uh, you know, an A plus A transpose operation. 
So that was easy during time period where you had single core CPUs, but that needed to be expanded outward, of course, as uh, as GPUs or CPUs went multi core. So you could see uh, we went from you know creating a uh, a single small matrix to then uh, needing to distribute the, that matrix across the multiple cores. Here we're using something called Dask to do that. Uh, Dask was eventually extended to be able to extend not just across you know, CPU threads, but even across uh, you know, clusters of, of several nodes, uh, as you could see here. But eventually, um, it we needed to, be to begin to uh, provide GPU acceleration. And we really want to return back to the simplicity of the first approach. And our answer to that is a package called Kunumeric. This was announced at GTC Fall. And it, is, it aims to become a drop-in replacement for, uh, for NumPy. And so you can see here, um, I'm not thinking about um, all of the GPUs on my system, and I'm not thinking about all of the nodes on my system. I'm thinking about uh, the the size of the work I need to do. So here's a, a 160,000 elements, and the numeric package is able to distribute this uh, this data structure across uh, your GPUs or even across many uh, nodes automatically. And so now I'm able to simply write the same A plus A transpose, and it will distribute the, both the data and the work. So people come to Python because it's a high productive language. And this is a, a fairly typical uh, code that you would write, uh, but they've come to expect performance as well. And we'd like to be able to deliver both. So this code is productive because it's simply sequential semantics. There's no uh, obvious need for uh, synchronization. There's no obvious uh, distribution of work, no partitioning of data. Um, and you can actually compose this well with uh, the rest of your uh, libraries or, or, or program. But it would be nice to be able to get high performance as well. And so being able to transparently run this anywhere you need and leverage all the variable hardware, whether it's a single GPU or many GPUs or even a whole system. So uh, we've uh, been building a system architecture called Legate, uh, which is this layer here. And Legate provides a way to uh, handle distributing of uh, data structures and, and work uh, transparently. Uh, and we'd like to extend that to the broader uh, Python ecosystem. But to start, we're focusing on NumPy using the Kunumeric uh, package. And so you can see here, um, the Kunumeric is, uh, we were able to take a um, an existing NumPy application, uh, we're, uh, plug in Kunumeric in place of, uh, of NumPy for our data structures, and actually run this code uh, across an um, entire machine full of GPUs. Now, if all I want to do is run on one GPU, there's already a package called KuPy that could have handled that. What's exciting about Kunumeric is not just that you can run on one GPU, but here I'm weak scaling it out to I'm showing here 1,024 GPUs. So that's uh, pretty exciting because we're able to do it with uh, uh, essentially no code changes. Uh, here's another code that, we're, uh, that we've demonstrated. This uh, came out of the uh, scikit image library. Uh, what's notable here is that um, this function didn't change at all. Uh, what we did was we uh, replaced the NumPy arrays with uh, Kunumeric arrays and we've run this and once again, this is actually weekly scaling. You can see that the throughput increases as we increase the number of GPUs. So that's Python. And we would really like to see uh, more people developing this. I will say that uh, Kunumeric is not um, uh, NumPy complete at this point. It is, um, it is still considered alpha software, but it is uh, really critical to um, our standard language parallels of strategy. And we'd love to see you trying it. So now let me shift uh, focus towards NVIDIA's uh, performance libraries. So the first thing is I want to, to give you is kind of the goals of our libraries. First is we want them to be seamless to use. So as we add new features to our hardware, you don't have to worry about how to, um, how to make use of those features that we can uh, build them into the libraries and you reap the benefits. We want you to be able to scale up. So you're not limited to a single GPU, but multi GPUs or even multiple nodes in some of our libraries. And lastly, make them um, composable uh, uh, among each other and, and with your programs. 
So we do have a large range of, uh, of libraries and I don't need to go through each of these. Most of the names are fairly uh, self-explanatory of what they provide. And I will point out that there's you know, a lot of excitement about uh, the tensor cores that we provide in our uh, GPUs, beginning with the, the V100 and expanding support in, uh, in the uh, A100s as well. And uh, the point of this slide is to demonstrate that for many of the operations in the library, uh, you don't need to enable the tensor core support that they will be used for you uh, under the hood and you uh, can reap, uh, reap the benefits of that automatically. So for instance, uh, the Kublaz library, uh, Kublaz provides a full implementation of the BLAS plus a variety of extensions such as uh, mixed or lower precision and uh, batched APIs. Uh, and these are actually used in, in a lot of, uh, of applications. And, uh, and what I would like to show here is that, um, you know, as you um, utilize these, uh, these libraries, that we're able to take advantage of the, uh, the hardware features for you. And so here you can see on uh, GP100, we're taking advantage of the 16-bit uh, the um, uh, uh, floating point performance using our tensor cores. And here you can see uh, you know, automatically out of the box, you're able to take advantage of, this, of that feature in A100 as well. Or even if you have a need for, uh, for different floating point types, such as the TF32, that you can utilize that as well and get very, uh, very good performance. Another library of interest would be uh, QSolver. QSolver uh, provides a variety of linear solvers, uh, LU, Cholesky, and QR, as well as uh, you know, symmetric and generalized eigensolvers. And uh, we do provide support for iterative refinement solvers, which allow you to utilize reduced precision to get full precision results. So you can actually take advantage under the hood of things like the 16-bit the uh, tensor core units to get very high speed um, uh, solvers, but expect the full 64-bit um, uh, precision on your results. And we provide support for multiple uh, GPUs as well. So uh, you know, I'll point out the automatic use of the, um, uh, the MMA instructions for, for using the tensor cores. Um, under the hood, so you don't need to opt into that. And you can see actually you get a pretty uh, significant performance speed up going from V100 to A100. Here we're showing 2.3x and actually in, uh, in more recent um, uh, versions uh, higher than that. And you can ignore this part at the bottom that just did not get stripped out. Um, for QSparse, if you're doing uh, sparse linear algebra, you can see we have uh, you know, a range of uh, capabilities uh, available to you. And again, we can get um, uh, very high performance. So this is uh, speed up uh, using our new um, generalized version of the solvers vers uh, versus the uh, uh, our previous solvers. So we um, uh, you can see more details about that in, um, in the uh, release notes. Um, QFFT, we do provide support for 1D, 2D, and 3D FFTs. Uh, including support for multiple GPUs. And you can see here across a variety of problem sizes, you can see support uh, for one, two, four, and, and eight GPUs uh, here. And then more recently, uh, support for uh, generalized uh, tensor contractions and reductions through using the uh, QTensor library. Now I want to highlight that we've uh, begun supporting uh, multi-node within several of our math libraries. And so one I'll point out here is QSolver MP. Uh, and here we're able to, to scale, not just across the GPUs in a single node, but across uh, multiple nodes up to full system size. And so uh, this uh, began support in uh, 21.11. Um, and so, and it's available uh, since then. So once again, you're running with 21.9. It does not have this, this library in it, but the next version as it's updated will have uh, support for that. Uh, we've also um, uh, released uh, early access support to uh, a multi-node version of QFFT. And you can see here that we're getting um, very good uh, performance there as well. Uh, for 
sake of time, I'll keep skipping ahead. Um, I want to point out that we have a rich set of what I would call core compute libraries for C++. Um, libcu, uh, the libcuda C++ or cu C++ is um, a standard template library that you can uh, utilize uh, on the GPUs. Uh, Thrust is a parallel algorithms library, and this was uh, very uh, this the Thrust project very heavily influenced what eventually went into the uh, the C++ standard as well, and then uh, the cooperative primitives library libcub. So Thrust has you know very high level classes like the host and device vectors, high level algorithms like transform, fill, and copy, and then uh, various iterators that you can use. And actually, in some of our um, early C++ examples, we're using these iterators uh, in there as well. And then if you need within your kernels to do uh, various collective communication patterns, you can use uh, CUB in order to expose that, things like warp-wide warp, uh, warp and device-wide uh, primitives. And here I'll point out libqc++. And so qc++ um, is in addition to your uh, standard uh, library that comes with your host compiler. So you would include you know, any of the normal, uh, you know, impound include vector, for instance, impound to include atomic to get the normal host side uh, standard template library. And then qc++ provides two interfaces, one that is strictly standards compliant, and it is a subset of uh, the, the standard library here which has the namespace CUDA standard. And then um, if you, we do have provide some extensions as well um, that are under the CUDA namespace. Uh, one such extension is, uh, is the atomic and there's some details. I can point you to a presentation that details that um, as well. So jumping ahead to the uh, communication libraries, I wanna point out that, you know, just like with the, with the math libraries, we hope to provide you with, um, a, uh, the right set of communication libraries that are optimized for the entire system. Also provide low latency um, uh, PGAS programming. This would be the you know, partition global address space. So things like uh, NVshmem and then um, optimize collectives on your system. Uh, we have um, several libraries that, provide, that are provided within the HPC SDK. HBCX uh, provides you with a uh, version of uh, OpenMPI. Uh, we also have support for uh, OpenShmem uh, in that as well, and, uh, and, and UCX and Sharp, which are um, technologies that came from, uh, from Mellanox. I'll point out that NVshmem is a technology that uh, we support that for um, uh, partition global address space uh, messaging uh, using the CPU or the GPU. So in typical MPI, you'd have something like issue an iSend uh, and, and then wait for the results to complete. And you can see that, that the, the data has to move uh, you know, through the CPU uh, uh, out to the network and back to the GPU. With NVshmem, the GPU can actually uh, initialize all of this if you want. So you can actually uh, you know, put messages through the network onto other GPUs or even get message, uh, get data uh, off of other GPUs. And so uh, this has um, also uh, interoperates well with, uh, with CUDA streams. So this is a program model that I encourage you to, uh, to take a look at. And there's a variety of um, trainings available online for that. Um, approaching the end here, I'll point out our developer tools. I know um, uh, Max has some talks about this coming up. Uh, and so I'll point out that we, uh, we provide inside our, our, our download support for the CUDA GDB, which is, uh, works just like GDB, but is, uh, understands our um, compilers as well. And also more recently, we've, um, uh, we've begun shipping an extension to, uh, um, to Visual Studio um, that, uh, and excuse me, Visual Studio Code. And then also there's the Insight Visual Studio edition as well. Uh, we also have profilers. Insight Systems is a profiler for um, getting high-level information of how your code is running. Um, you know, is your compute and your data movement are they overlapped and, and things like that. When you want to drill down into individual kernels, we provide Insight Compute, and there's a uh, you can see here um, a, a screenshot showing the 
uh, the roof line analysis of a particular uh, code. And then support for um, uh, NVTX is something that you would learn about uh, later today, I believe. Uh, the NVIDIA tools extensions that allow you to annotate your code and uh, so you can look at it and say, okay, you know, this is time spent in my solver or this is time spent uh, you know, at other points of the code. Um, compute sanitizer is a way to just check for, um, you know, if something crashes, try to understand uh, why things like if, uh, if we uh, access an array out of bounds on the GPU or if we're using a shared memory in an unsafe way. And so compute sanitizer, if you're familiar with CUDA memcheck, compute sanitizer is the, uh, the next generation CUDA memcheck. And lastly, we provide integrations with various IDEs. Uh, we do ship Insight Eclipse Edition and Visual uh, Insight Visual Studio Edition, but what you may not be aware of is that we also provide support for a Visual Studio Code, and that's fairly recent. So Insight Systems is our system level profiler that gives you, again, the high level information about how your program is doing. Insight Compute is our lower level, really understanding you know, what uh, what is limiting your code? Is it limited by compute or is it limited by memory? And you can even dig down as far as you want and, and look at uh, AR, our underlying assembly if you really want to dig in and understand, uh, understand the performance of your code. Uh, Insight Visual Studio Code Edition here, as I mentioned, is very new. You can uh, find out more information about how to get it here or search for the Visual Studio, Mark, uh, Visual Studio Code Marketplace. And you can see uh, it provides ways to in, uh, you know, inspect the um, inspect your variables, look at your, your your registers, and really understand uh, and, and debug your code directly within your IDE, including support uh, via SSH. Now, I will point out from my experience that Visual Studio Code, the remote SSH, does not work on Summit, but will work on uh, x86 platforms. Uh, here's uh, a little bit of an example about. Uh, CUDA GDP and uh, compute sanitizer as well. So scanning your code. Um, what I'll point out here is memcheck is an operation uh, that allows you to look for uh, unsafe memory accesses, look for memory leaks, look for um, uh, out of bounds errors, things like that. Race check is a tool for if you're using shared memory, understanding did you uh, have uh, unsafe memory access patterns to that shared memory. Uh, init check is one for uh, checking for you know, reading from uninitialized memory. And then uh, sync check is, uh, watches for uh, thread synchronization issues. So um, as you can see, compute sanitizer is um, quite a bit more advanced than what was available in, uh, in CUDA memcheck. So I did want to leave just a tiny bit of time for questions. I was not very successful, but I'll put this back up here and point out the HPC SDK as uh, as your means of getting access to everything that I've shown. And um, I guess there's uh, you know, two or three minutes left where I can answer some questions. Are there any questions? Um, you could unmute and speak up or type question in Slack channel, please. Hey, sure, I have a question. Um, you showed some uh, results with um, Lulash and OpenMP, but it looked like the OpenMP code was the basically the older um, like CPU based directives. Mm -hmm. And I've I've noticed that NVIDIA or there maybe not NVIDIA, but there are some specific directives used for GPU um, acceleration, like target teams, um, for instance. And yes. I wondered if if um, if you guys had used those, if it would have perhaps made a difference. So this, um, I I don't know whether there is a version of Lulesh that supports the the target offload directives. Uh, there may be, um, be, given that it came from Lawrence Livermore, there very likely is. Uh, but this is the the baseline code that was provided to us, which is the the CPU threaded one. Um, you know, it it would be possible to you know write a you know target teams. Uh, you know, distribute here and, and here and, and offload these in that way. I would not expect the performance to be as good because of various uh, overheads um, associated with, uh, with doing that. But functionally, uh, it would certainly be possible to write such a code. Uh, we believe that um, a, 
a better approach is to use the uh, the standard C++ rather than relying on uh, OpenMP as an additional API. So hi, Jeff, this is Zheng Ji. Um, I have a question about your uh, cool solver MP implementation, yes. and also you have F cool FFT MP. So those, uh, I mean, the, the cross node uh, communication, what kind of library did, did you guys use? I believe it's based on libfabric. Um, I would have to con uh, confirm that. I do know that it has been uh, tested on on both Perlmutter and Summit, so we do know uh, that it does work on those. I think it uses Lib Fabric, which um, each of the vendors are able to implement their own layer underneath. So is MPI used, or you skip no. that? Yeah. No, it actually goes to a lower level than MPI. Also, I have another question. Like you have uh, shown many performance result from like uh, your tool, I mean, you showed many better performance than like OpenMP or like some offload result. So when you do this uh, standard language parallelism implementation, did you still use a CUDA or something else? I'm just curious how your performance is that much better than other, other things. So uh, in, in uh, both of these cases, uh, no uh, CUDA C++ is used. Um, if you were to rewrite it in CUDA C++, there are some uh, optimizations that you can accomplish in CUDA C++ or CUDA Fortran that can't be done um, in standard language parallelism. So I would actually expect that it would be possible to tune this even further. Um, but of course, you know, the trade-off there is, uh, is in, in portability. If your goal is to write something that you can right away bring to new platforms and expect it to run in parallel right out of the box, uh, standard language parallelism provides that. And actually, a better slide to show you would be this one. Uh, each of these codes can run out of the box on multiple CPUs or on GPUs. But if I want to get, uh, if my goal is absolute best possible performance, I would write my code uh, with this on the right. Now, the thing I should emphasize here, and I should have emphasized at the beginning, is that you don't have to choose one of these, and you're not wed to one approach, that all of these approaches compose with each other. So I can start with, uh, you know, Fortran do good current. I can um, selectively optimize with, um, uh, with uh, directives if necessary, or if I have a portion of my code that is so performance critical that it absolutely needs to be written in uh, in CUDA, I can do that and all of those work together. So this is not a pick one and stick with it, but this is uh, the your um, your baseline starting point, and this on the right is your absolute best performance. Okay, thank you. Well, Jeff, are you able to see the Slack questions or should I uh, read them to you? Uh, if you could please have, read them. It's hard yeah, to we have two more minutes. Um, if the time, when time runs out, I will just uh, ask you to answer them in Slack. So one question from Philip Thomas is, what is the state of the CUDA graphics feature, particularly with respect to in-standard programming for C++ Fortran? Is this feature under active development? So CUDA graphs is uh, absolutely, continues to be in active development. Um, right now, we don't um, we, we don't have any defined interactions between uh, standard language parallelism and CUDA graphs. Um, that's uh, something that we uh, could explore in the future, uh, but right now they they are uh, you know two separate approaches. Those of you who aren't familiar with CUDA graphs, uh, the the basic introduction would be if you uh, have a series of uh, data transfers and uh, GPU kernels that you call repeatedly within your application, rather than uh, you inside of your time step loop, you know, going through and issuing your memory request, and issuing the kernel after kernel after kernel, uh, which has various launch overheads, you can capture all of those into a graph that you basically pre-compile and, uh, and just relaunch over and over again on the GPU and, and um, that takes away various overheads. So uh, we don't currently have an interface to CUDA graphs within uh, the standard languages, that is something that, that does require you to use this, this specialized uh, CUDA C++ 
uh, to use it. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there's another question in Zoom chat. I'll read it to you. How does, it's from K.O. Hearn. Um, how does performance compare against CUDA versus standard C++ and Fortran codes? That is, in the past, writing CUDA code was often the suggestion to achieve the best performance possible. Is this still the case? So if your goal is the best performance on the GPU you have, uh, CUDA C++ or CUDA Fortran is, is, the way to, uh, is the way to accomplish that. There are low level hardware features that you know, we, we can't expose in, in standard C++ or it takes you know, many years to get exposed in, in the standard C++. So uh, if you really want to tune for the best performance on the GPU you have, you would write it in CUDA C++ or CUDA Fortran. Of course, the trade-off there is the more you tune for that GPU, the more specialized your code is, the less uh, the less portable it is. Uh, 